Ladies and gentlemen, last year's Lowry Lecture took place amid an atmosphere of foreboding about the fate of the global economy. This year, we look back with astonishment at how we have avoided the financial meltdown. The crisis, though deep, was much shorter and most than most would have predicted. Australia seems to have avoided a recession and is seen by many as a miracle economy, as it was 10 years ago when it navigated through the Asian financial crisis. Economists agree that one reason for our lucky escape has been the continuing demand for our commodities by China, Japan, Korea and India. Whichever way you look at it, resources will matter in our future as a nation. We face a future which commodities export will play an increasingly dominant role in the Australian economy, especially as the Australian dollar strengthened against the greenback. With rising international demand for commodities and growing concern about supply security, Australia faces a growing tide of inbound investment targeting our resource sector. Unlike in the past, there are new and unfamiliar aspects of this investment that could pose challenges for Australian governments and society. Australia's role as an exporter of energy and commodities has also become more complex as global concerns mount over the issue of climate change. In short, we have a continental abundance of resources in a world that is increasingly hungry for them. By any measure, resources will become even more central to our international affairs in the years ahead. Who better to discuss these issues than Marius Kloppes, the CEO of the world's largest mining company, BHP Billiton. Marius Kloppes was born in South Africa. He obtained a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Pretoria in South Africa and PhD in materials and science at the MIT Institute in the United States. He began his career in South Africa working in petrochemicals with Sasol and in materials research with Mintech. After receiving an MBA from INSEAD in France, he worked as management consultant with McKinsey and Company in Netherlands. Mr. Kloppes joined Billiton Group in 1993 as a core member of the team that created the group's aluminium business and became the company's chief operating officer for aluminium. He played a central role in the merger of BHP Billiton as chief marketing officer and then as chief commercial officer. Mr. Kloppes was appointed to group executive and chief executive of Nonferrous in July 2007 and has been chief executive officer of BHP Billiton since October 2007. Marius tonight's, audience, Marius, tonight's audience shows the great interest in the Australian community in the resources sector and its role in this country's future. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on this topic. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So this, uh, this lecture series is entitled Australia in the World, and the theme is very central to what Frank Lowy intended when he established the Lowy Institute, to provide a forum for ideas about the way Australia relates to the world, how world events shape Australia, and how Australia in turn can shape the world. Frank Lowy's life in itself is a classic story of Australia in the world. He came to Australia from the tragedy of wartime Europe, built a wonderful Australian company here, then took that company to the world, becoming a leader in its industry. No one knows better than Frank Lowy on how Australia's companies reflect, project, and to a significant degree, create Australia's place in the world. Of course, the only thing I'm happy about is that Frank didn't go into the resources business and became a competitor. So it's a special honor for me and for my company that the Lowy Institute has invited me here today to be the first business person to, to deliver the Lowy Lecture. Um, I'm here today because I have the honor to lead BHP Billiton, a company that is at the heart of a great and vital industry 
and at the heart of shaping Australia's role uh, in the world. My title for today's lecture is Australia's Resources in the World, and my theme is very simple. Australia's resources has had a great past, and we can look forward to an even greater future. Our excellent prospects, both my companies and Australia's, comes from, uh, more than anything else, from the capacity to seize the opportunities that will be offered by the dramatic transformation that we are witnessing in Asia. How this uh, transformation continues will make a huge difference to the future of our company and indeed to the future of this country. For this reason, I will not only review the prospects for BHP Billiton and the industry that I find myself in, <clears throat> but I will also touch on some of the broader questions about the shifting international outlook uh, in Asia over the next few decades that will shape the environment in which BHP Billiton and Australia operates. So let me, uh, before I begin, uh, you do have a company person here tonight, and so I have to draw your attention to the, uh, to the normal disclaimers, uh, which are important uh, in relation to the, uh, to the information that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, for your benefit, they normally fit this on three slides, but they see that they've, they've cut it down to one slide tonight. Um, but let me begin on home turf. Um, BHP and Billiton came together in 2001 with rich histories of their own. Of course, as many of you know, BHP's beginnings trace back to the discovery of lead and silver uh, in outback New South Wales in, uh, in Broken Hill in 1883. For Billiton, it was the discovery of tin uh, more than 30 years prior to that in the uh, Indonesian uh, island, which was then called Billiton, which is now called Bilitung. Uh, and so the companies have had, you know, roughly 150 years of up, ups and downs in the world that miners inhabit. However, in the past decade is when I believe BHP Billiton has undergone the most striking change as it's grown to be the largest in its industry. Uh, and so striking and dramatic has this change be, been that for many Australians they still associate this company with steel making even though we, uh, we no longer make steel and we, we fashion ourselves as a provider of raw materials and energy. Today, we, uh, we employ people in some 100 locations in, uh, in 25 countries, from uh, in the Arctic Circle in Canada uh, to, uh, to the searing heat of the Pilbara. We go from uh, our Escondida mine at more than 3,000 meters above sea level in Chile to 1,000 meters below surface in uh, Leinster in, in Western Australia. We continue to build this business by investing, on average, $30 million every day in growth. Um, and despite this massive growth and massive investment that I've spoken about, uh, BHP Billiton um, retains very strong Australian foundations. We headquartered in Australia. 50% of our operating assets are in Australia which is about three times as much as we have in any other individual country. Now, the main force of, of change for us has been the extraordinary pace of industrialization and urbanization in many developing economies, which brings me to the first topic that I want to talk about tonight, namely global economic growth. Global economic growth over the last 20 years, which roughly matches my time in this sector, has been very large. Um, we should reflect on just how far the world economy and many societies have come in this period, notwithstanding the recent setback. So in the, in the 20 years leading up to the, uh, to the crisis, global GDP grew at about 3% per annum in real terms. The number sounds modest, but the proceeds of this uh, growth has made a very, very profound change to the lives of, of billions of people. And it will become particularly evident as I talk about the division of growth between developed and developing economies in just a minute. 
But let's talk a little bit about the benefits of growth. <coughs> the benefits of growth have been borne out in be better living standards across lower income countries. For example, infant mortality rates have fallen by a third across the de developing world. The number of children being immunized increased by 93% in the 12 years to 2007. Consumption of electricity is up 74% between 85 and 2006. Proportion of people with access to adequate water supply is up nearly 20% from 1990 to 2006. Yes, we've got a lot to do. It's going to take some time to reach the Millennium Goals, but the evidence is clear. Economic growth makes a difference and produces better lives for people. Now, I promised that I would talk about developed and developing country growth. Importantly, if we look at the, the growth and we split it up, um, the, the world growth has really been driven by developing econ uh, economy growth, which has basically grown at three times the speed on a percentage basis um, when, when measured against the rest of the world, and specifically by the transformation we've got in Asia. This transformation didn't start yesterday. It really started with the, uh, in, the, in the 1950s, and it started in Japan. Now, of course, Japan had started building Asia's first industrial economy in the 1860s, but after the Second World War, largely through the power and benevolence of the United States, um, they, um, they took advantage of the vast new markets opened up. And when uh, Taiwan and Korea joined them in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, this transformation started becoming really remarkable. For China to now follow Japan's lead in building a modern industrial society, uh, three fundamental things were needed. First, it needed an, an, an effective government that could uh, guarantee reasonable levels of stability. Um, secondly, it needed policy, policies and institutions to stimulate the economy. And third, it needed access to markets. Now, the struggle to unify China under, under one, uh, one uh, central government really started more than 100 years ago, uh, was finally realized perhaps 60 years ago, uh, but you know, really endured after, after that establishment another 30 years of dysfunctional economies and turbulent politics. Before, in 19, September 1978, Deng Xiaoping famously inaugurated market-oriented economic policies. I believe the quote was, I don't care what color the mouse is, or the cat is, as long as it catches mice, uh, was the quote. And access to global markets became possible and, and really opened up by the 72 visit of Nixon. So from there, the trajectory, particularly since 1978, may not be unprecedented in, in, in what has happened, but the scale of this has clearly been something dramatically different from what we've seen before. The dividend for China for the long and painful rise through the 20th century has been the largest, fastest increase in human material welfare the world has ever seen. And uh, hundreds of millions of people have moved from low productivity subsistence agriculture to higher productivity modern economy. It's also changed its society. Take the, um, the industrialization and urbanization that has taken place there. Just by way of illustration, today Australia's got five cities with more than a million people. I think Europe has got 35. By 2030, China will have 220. And from now, to then, it'll build 50,000 new skyscrapers, or about 600 times as many as Sydney has got. Now, for us as a company, steel is the raw material of industrialization. It is the base foundation of industrialization. Steel is made principally using iron ore, coke and coal, manganese, commodities that, amongst others, Australia has in abundance. And so not surprisingly, we feel that we've been a part of, uh, of fueling this growth. We feel that Australia has been a part. Australia has the supply. The world 
provides the demand and we see ourselves as one of the links in this equation. One recent measure of how these linkages work is that Australia supplies about a third of the, of the iron ore that China imports to drive this industrialization. Of course, it also helps that we are very proximate geographically to this engine of growth. And we're not only proximate to China, population 1.3 billion, but we're also pro proximate to India, population 1.2 billion, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Malaysia, and so on, all of which have got their sights set on this growth trajectory. However, I would be lying if I said it's all good down to good fortune and geography. Australian companies and governments have worked very hard to become the supplier of choice for raw materials, and particularly since it wasn't always the supplier of choice. Economic reforms in the 80s and 90s have helped greater labor flexibility. We've had great financial fiscal stability for investment, which has helped Australia capitalize on the good fortune, and has reversed the image of Australia that it once had of being a poor reliability raw material supplier. It's truly been a case of good preparation meeting a good opportunity. Australia's resources companies are best in class. Australia runs most, uh, some of the most productive operations in the world. Australian companies run environmentally sustainable operations. They ensure community engagement. They respect traditional owners and they create wealth for their shareholders. Together, these factors make Australia the lead supplier for many of the needs of the industrializing world. And our companies, uh, companies such as ours, are examples of positive purpose as well as global success. Not only are these resources, however, um, important to the world, they are also ever more important to Australia. Mining, both minerals and ener energy materials, is Australia's third largest industry sector by direct contribution. And if we factor in the indirects, we get up to something like 18% of GDP. And moreover, it's a sector that is growing at about twice the rate of the, uh, of the average of the economy. And so this year witnessed an important event. Uh, export revenues for mining oil and gas surpassed both the $100 billion uh, mark uh, and surpassed manufacturing revenues for the first time. And um, there is a real upside for Australians in this changing of the guard as this, this industry continues to grow. Firstly, mining jobs are high value add. Average mining person earns $85,000 per year. The average in manufacturing is 48000 per year. Overall, mining employees add five times more value to the economy than manufacturing. So there is a real changing of the guard taking place here. Resources account for huge investment and employment in indigenous communities, rural communities, something which a largely urbanized Australia may not fully appreciate the role that it plays. And as somebody who came here relatively recently, I always say, I doubt very much if the average Australian in the street understands how much their prosperity in, and welfare is linked to the resources sector. Thirdly, there's been huge secondary effects. Services to mining from Australia are prized globally. Perth is a hub for mining software engineers, bulk logistics experts, and heavy machinery engineers. Australia exports not only minerals, but it exports people and it exports services, ideas, and so forth. And uh, we've already heard from Frank that you know, we've, uh, we've weathered the global financial crisis better than other economies. And a number of factors obviously explain this resilience. But the IMF cites, and I, and, and I, and I quote, and it starts with strong commodity exports and then goes on about government policies and so on and so on. By value, resources account for 40% of Australia's exports. And unlike you know, Europe's, uh, the US's and so on, all uh, exports who de declined dramatically during this, uh, this uh, fiscal crisis that we had, 
export volumes in, in our sector didn't decline dramatically. So um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about where we find ourselves in, that, uh, in, 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 the, in the present difficulties and then go on to talk a little bit more about the long term. And I just thought I'd put up on one slide that, uh, that would compare the current uh, you know, economic distress that we've got uh, with other historic crises. And I think that you know, our co company is relatively modest in its, in its, in its short-term outlook and, and looks at previous periods and, say, and says, look, some of these, these crises has, have had long tails. And I'm obviously talking about on a global basis, not, not only on a domestic basis. Now, clearly, within Australia, we've seen very, very dramatic recovery in our sector on the back of very strong Chinese purchasing. But it's important for us to understand that that Chinese purchasing was on the one hand restocking and on the other hand consumption. And our baseline, when you asked me perhaps six or nine months ago, asking my, my view of what would happen, I, I said, well, the OECD will pick up, they will restock, China's restocking will stop, and the interplay of this will give us relatively buoyant conditions. However, the verdict is still a little bit out on the, uh, on the OECD. There's still a lot of hardship out there. And I think that on balance, we've seen uh, the world come out of this uh, recession a little bit more slowly than we've seen in, 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 in other events. So as you can see from my comments, we remain relatively cautious in the short and medium term. However, despite this short-term uncertainty, the real driver of what I started talking about is the long term. And I must tell you that the long-term growth prospects for resources is, as my, and my, my script here says, strong, I would say incredibly strong, with demand driven by those developing economies that we just spoke about, starting with China. And in order to just go back to something that I said before, which is that we haven't seen something of this scale happening, let's just try and get a sense of the size of demand and take a look at steel intensity of nations. As they, uh, as they develop. And we overlay China and India on this graph, and we see countries really at the beginning of their development journey. And as you, as you see from this graph, and what it predicts is that as GDP per capita rises, steel intensity rises. And uh, if, if you consider that these two countries, China and India, has got nearly 40% of the world's population, then what you, what, you, what you do is if you start taking a look at China alone and you say, well, there's no reason the steel intensity is not going to peak somewhere where, where Japan and Korea has peaked, and if we pick somewhere between those two countries, then we find out that between now and 2025, China is going to need somewhere between 18 and 25 billion tons of iron ore to make that steel. And then you say... Well, in the past five years, it's consumed five billion tons of iron ore. And then you start saying five, 15, uh, sorry, 18 to 25, and you start seeing the leveraging effect of what happens if an economy industrializes. Now, Australia stands to benefit significantly to benefit uh, from this demand. Export and tax re revenues, GDP, <laughs> um, employment, will all increase with Australia's ability to capture its fair share of this growth. And while we have reason to be confident about this future, we must recognize that it is not assured. The future of Australia's resources in the world will, will depend on the demand that I've spoken about, the availability of supply, and the efficiency of markets. So we need uh, to manage the pressures of growth, both domestic and international, and we need to maintain the competitiveness of supply from Australia, all within a global, uh, open global market. And I therefore want to explore, as one of the core parts of my speech tonight, the actual and perceived challenges to the future demand, supply, and exchange of, uh, of Australia's resources. I will not talk about uh, greenhouse emissions tonight, uh, principally because it's a topic on its own, and principally because my chairman covered, covered that uh, in great depth. 
uh, a couple of weeks ago. But apart from that, I, I'd like to explore just the drivers of, of what is going to make us successful here. Now, we start off with China's development. We can't take the development path for granted. We've seen that the economic rationale for continued growth is compelling, but there are other forces at work in this economy. China is doing something which is vast in scale and therefore immensely difficult and in many ways unprecedented. Many things will have to go right. China will need to manage political, social, and may I add environmental pressures that inevitably accompany rapid change. And like all of us, um, it will have to depend on the maintenance of a peaceful and stable international environment to achieve that. Some of the observers often comment to me that inherent political and social tensions pose an inevitable challenge to China's growth. I don't believe that to be true. No doubt China's political and social system will have to adapt and develop over the coming decades to manage the pressures of economic development. No one can exactly say what form those changes will take, but I see no reason why these changes cannot take place. China in 30 years' time will be different from the China of today, as it is different from the China of Mao. But the last 30 years have illustrated one thing, that it is a system that is capable of managing the changes.